I'm literally going to put it back in the pot and plate it again. <laughs> TV magic. Hello everyone, Salim Barahmi, Director of PIPD here. I want to welcome you to another episode of Dardashi and Tabikh, a series where we talk at length with amazing and inspiring Palestinians about their lives and the work they do. Today we're joined by Reem Kassis, author of the award-winning cookbook, The Palestinian Table. Reem, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. How are you holding up during these surreal times? I mean, we're surviving. We're cooking a lot. We <laughs> keep ourselves busy, but it's, it's crazy out here too. That's good. What do you find yourself cooking mostly these days? Things that my kids will eat because they're home 24 seven and I, I want them to help out in the kitchen. So I ended up making pasta with a pasta maker the other day and noodles and a lot of basic stuff. And we're also baking a lot of bread. Oh, but supermarkets cool. are running out of flour, so. Oh no. I've never, that's one thing I've never been able to, to master and therefore haven't had the courage to do. I, baking is, is to me is like the, the final frontier of cooking. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I like making bread because it's forgiving. Cakes, I don't like to follow recipes, so um, I feel yeah. your pain. Of course. Um, Reem, I wanted to, I, I, full disclosure, we know each other. We went to, we went to high school together. And I, I wanted to ask if you could share some of your memories of growing up in, in Jerusalem throughout the 90s and 2000s. I know you, you talk about a lot how, you know, you saw your mom and your grandma cooking, and that was a big inspiration for you. And you know, what was, what was the time like back then? I think it's interesting you asked that question because just last night I was telling my husband there's so much that when you're experiencing as a child, you take it as normal. Mm -hmm. And then you start looking back on it 10, 15 years later and you think, I can't believe I actually lived through this. I mean, I was trying to watch a movie last night and it was just, it felt too traumatic to relive all that. It's called America. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen it. And they show yeah. all the scenes at checkpoints and whatnot. Growing up, a lot of that stuff felt second nature to me. It was just the way we lived. Um, but then there were also the positives, which I took for granted. You know, once I left, I started to see that the times I spent with my mother and my grandmother cooking and eating, it wasn't the norm everywhere else outside mm -hmm. yeah. uh, our country. So, you know, growing up, I had a typical childhood for, I guess, Palestinians, you know, we went to school, we went home, we ate together as a family, people didn't work very late, uh, you know, the whole family ate together, maybe at three, four, latest five, and then weekends were spent with the extended family. Um, I've talked about this before, but maybe I haven't mentioned it to you, but my mother used to always shoo me out of the kitchen and know, really? go study, yeah. <laughs> Anytime she would see me cooking, she'd be like, go study. This is not for you. You know, you have to focus on your education. Why are you in the kitchen? And, you know, eventually I ended up going to university. And I remember, I think it was a few weeks before I left, I was with my father and he said to someone that, hey, you know, Reem got into this university in the U.S. and she's leaving. And the guy asks him, why are you going to pay all that money to send her to university in the U.S.? Don't you know she's going to end up in the kitchen like all Arab women do? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I know. So at 17, no, I was very angry. I'm like, what's he talking about? This is horrible. No, of course I won't. And I'm going to prove to him that he's wrong and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I ended up, I went to university for four years, did my MBA straight after. I worked in consulting. I came back. I worked at McKinsey in Tel Aviv. And then I moved to London, got another master's, worked in executive search. And it was only when my first daughter was born that I did end up back in the kitchen. But mm. I guess, you know, I always say I ended up there out of choice, not circumstance, which is a whole different playing field. Yeah. And, you know, having grown up where I did, I guess there was always a stereotype of, like I told you, my mother shooting me out mm -hmm, of the kitchen, mm -hmm. that the kitchen is, you know, not a good place to be. It's very lowbrow, et cetera. But I do see now how food can actually be very powerful, a great medium with which to share our story mm -hmm. with the world. So. Well, what, what was what was that moment for you? I, I think you mean you you went to some of the best universities in the world. You had a business career going. What what made you transition into cooking and and writing a cookbook and cuisine? I think in hindsight, these journeys that you see people go on, they seem very like you know a certain flat mm. trajectory going up or whatnot. But when you're in it, it's a lot of different bumps along the road and things that change. I would say I almost fell into it rather than that it was a super conscious decision to do it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, once we moved to London, I started seeing how popular Middle Eastern food was. There were a lot of dishes and restaurants that were, you know, this is Israeli, this is not. And I would go in and my mind was away from the politics at the time, but I would think, oh my God, this is what my mother makes at home, but we make it so much better. I wish I could, you know, help people see how good it can be made. Um, yeah. I didn't think to do much with that until my first daughter was born. And at that point, I felt I was raising her away from her family, from her culture and the community that I had grown up with. And I wanted to give her a piece of that. So I started compiling the recipes and stories that I had grown up with in a more organized fashion. From there, I you know, pitched the idea to agents, from agents to publishers. The book came out. The book did way better than I thought it would. And that kind of made me transition to that full time. So it wasn't you know, this whole, oh, I gave up on my business career and transitioned to cooking. Mm -hmm. It was... A series of steps in which I ended up. Yeah. This. What What were some of the the recipes or some of the food that you missed when you moved abroad when you were in the U.S. and oh, London? God, everything. I mean, I used to sometimes drive my mother crazy and say, "I don't like this. I don't like that. I want this. I want that." And then once I got to university, it was like anything that my mother made was so much better than what I was eating there. Uh, stuffed chicken was and remains my favorite dish mm. of all time. Yummy. But it's funny that there were some very simple dishes that back home I thought, ugh, are we really having this again? Which I'm cooking one of them today. It's chubbeze. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a lot of those dishes that are associated with specific events or times. You know, uh, it's uh, the start of spring when we go to the mountain and forage for the greens or fall when it's olive harvest season and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I think I missed a lot of the, the dishes that had different family aspects tied to them. That was actually one of the biggest culture shocks I had because I'm from Jericho. That's, I think that's where Chabez right. is mainly from, right? Yeah, Chabez uh, and all of that. Those exactly. Um, and so I went to university in Wisconsin and the biggest culture shock for me wasn't just the weather, et cetera. It was going home at a certain time and having a family cooked meal. Right. How do you, how do you explain tabikh to people? It's, I mean... To me, I always, if we have steak or if we make pasta, at the end of the night, I tell my husband, I didn't have tabikh today. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny. It's across the Arab world. The main, the staple meal is a rice with stew. Mm -hmm. And from a health perspective, it's one of the healthiest things to eat. You have tomatoes, you have vegetables, meat plays a small role, you have starch. It's, and, you know, I could go on about it forever, but... To me, it's these dishes, more than just the food itself, I think tabikh is also the idea that it's a family meal, right? It's mm -hmm. not an individual steak that you're serving a person. It's mm -hmm. a dish that's eaten family style, that's eaten with your family. And that's the kind of atmosphere I try to replicate here all the time. So yeah, our house, yeah. I always say it's like a train station. I literally leave the apartment door open and my husband's like, you don't live back home. You can't keep doing that. <laughs> but I do anyway. And like friends come in and we eat and they go, obviously now it's, that's been one of the hardest things is adjusting to life in isolation for the last few weeks where people okay. that we see multiple times a week and we eat together, we just don't see them. Mm. Yeah, it's hard, especially when you come from a very communal oriented society and culture where everything is done in big groups and together. I don't know if you experienced that, but the first few times I would invite people over for lunch or dinner and I would cook, they would be shocked. Like, really? You're going to invite me over? You're going to cook? You're going to feed me? I don't have to bring anything? And it's, yeah, I mean, this is how we do it. But it's, it took a while for a lot of our friends to get used to the idea. But now it's, they love it. I always, I always laugh a bit when, you know, one of my non-Arab friends asks me what I can bring to, to lunch. And you have to say nothing. Just, nothing. just And they don't get it. <laughs> no, no. So, Reem, let's, let's talk about the recipe you want to make for us today. Run us through it. So I was telling you, we're uh, going to make khubbeze. Now, khubbeze, like you said, it's a plant that's really native to our region. It starts mm. growing wild at the end of winter. And now is the end of the season. It's hard to find it here. I mean, it's, mm. I think the scientific name is some kind of mallow um, from the same family as in Luchiyah. So mm -hmm. since living here, I've started experimenting with different greens, different ways of making it. So I use Swiss chard a lot. Today, mm -hmm. I'm using a mixture of cooking greens. So there's all these farms that used to supply restaurants, which cannot anymore. So you can get direct deliveries to your house. And I got a really nice box of cooking greens. So I'm using that. Um, there's different ways to do it. My grandmother used to cook it mm -hmm. in water, just literally boil it. Then she would fry onions until they were so dark just before they burned. 
and add it to it. And then she would also add this hand rolled dough. Zayil maftool, but a bit bigger. Mm-hmm. And it's the onions that really give it the flavor. The maftool gives it, uh, you know, it makes it a hefty meal. Again, I've been alternating, you know, altering these recipes. So I'm using this, which is, it's called frigola sarda. It's Italian, Sardinian, which is not surprising, given the mm-hmm. Arab influence on Sardinia. And so I don't have to roll anything by hand. Um, the greens, I'm going to cook them the same way she does, and I'm going to fry the onions. So do you want to, I'm going to chop a bit yeah. of the greens. So these are just, you know, part of, you want to chop them small enough. Obviously, they're going to wilt when you cook them. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to be. It's, it's hard to get probably chubbez in the U.S., isn't it? Chubbez is quite hard. Um, mm-hmm. If you go to places like Patterson or Allentown, which are, you know, they have very big Arab communities. If you go around springtime, you might mm-hmm. find. But it's not the kind of thing that you're going to find in the supermarket. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. Even so, farms don't grow it here. If So people watching this want to make this at home. You said some of the alternatives are... So Swiss chard is a great alternative. It's just a very mild green. Mm-hmm. Um, other things right now, what I'm using is it's the bag is cooking greens is what they call it. It has a mixture of Swiss chard. It has, I think, um, some baby kale. Again, you could use stronger tasting greens, right? Like you could use collard greens. You could use Russian kale, Cavallo Nero. It's going to taste a little different. Your mm-hmm. the, uh, the greens might be a bit more bitter, but this fried onion that I was telling you about, that's what really gives it the flavor. So it's super easy, Salem. You literally you just take the greens, you put mm-hmm. them in a pot. Here I have roughly three very heavily packed cups. And I'm going to add to that three cups of water as well. And again, the thing I love about this kind of cooking is that it's very forgiving. So let's say I put too much water and I find it watery. I just have to put the heat up and let it evaporate. Mm-hmm. If it's not watery enough, you can add a bit after. Did you did you struggle with finding Palestinian ingredients when you first moved and you were craving uh, all, all the good stuff that we used to get back home regularly? So it's interesting. I mean, when I first came here to Penn, it was 2005. And at that time, I, there was very few stores that would sell, you know, um, ingredients that I remember from back home. Nowadays, you're starting things like zata, tahine, mm. sumana, those you can find them everywhere now. Hummus, tahine, all that stuff, you find it in mainstream supermarkets. You know, I go to Whole Foods and they have it. But, you know, if I want kusa, bitinjan, if I want specific pickles or, uh, you know, very particular ingredients, you have to go to a Middle Eastern grocery store. Yeah. Um, with Palestinian food in particular, I think, as you know, because of the conflict that we're in and the issues that we face, I think Palestinians have long felt that anything we do has to address the conflict. Anything else we do is taking away or detracting from its importance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I was telling you about what I realized with food being powerful, I think people started realizing food is also a way to hold on to our culture. Mm -hmm. It's a way to share our story. And I think that's what's given a rise to the wave of Palestinian books that you're seeing, you know, Palestinian chefs and restaurants and so forth. And I think you see, I mean, there's been a lot of coverage recently in the New York Times, the Washington Post. It's just becoming more okay to talk about Palestinian food. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you wrote, um, you know, quite a critically acclaimed cookbook, uh, The Palestinian Table. Did you, what kind of reaction did it get? My book is very apolitical. The word mm-hmm. Israel doesn't show up in the book even once. Did I plan to do this from the beginning? No. Mm-hmm. But my plan was simply to tell the Palestinian story through food. And I realized you could tell that story without getting into the politics. And mm-hmm. it turned out that that was a very good decision or thing that I ended up doing because it made it very accessible to people who might have been anti the very idea of Palestinian food to begin with. Mm-hmm. So when mm-hmm. you are basically just reading stories about people's lives and livelihoods. And inevitably there, you know, there's a story in the book about how my uh, maternal grandparents' own parents had to leave their house during the 1948 war. And it's a funny story about how my great grandfather didn't want to leave because there was food on the table. Mm -hmm. And it's a funny story, but -hmm. at the same time, you see the tragedy behind it. But when you're not pushing it in a very 
confrontational way, people are much more likely to respond. And I found a lot of positive reaction from both sides of the spectrum, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, with that said, there's also been criticisms from the Palestinian community that the book is not political, but at the same time, it's, it's a cookbook. You know, it's not a PhD dissertation on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's mm -hmm. literally my, the history of Palestinian food as told through my family. And, and you wrote a, a very powerful um, Washington Post article, and, and you made the distinction between uh, cultural diffusion and cultural appropriation. And I think it's a very apt a nuanced distinction to make when talking about, I think, a lot of Israelis and Israeli chefs taking Palestinian food and making it their own. Do you want right. to elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, absolutely. So, again, I'm working on my second book now, mm. and that one takes a wider lens. So the first one is Palestinian. This one, I got into the history of food and researching it, and it's fascinating to see how if you go far enough back in time, there is no such thing as national cuisine. The entire idea of nation states is a relatively recent mm -hmm. phenomenon of the 18th and 19th mm -hmm. century. Food is regional. So even our food, Palestinian, Lebanese, Syrian, we all shared the same food up until, you know, less than a century ago. And mm -hmm. we were all Bilad is Sham. And the differences between Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Jordan was the differences that you would have between neighbors. But I think this, the rise of nationalism and the rise of, you know, conflicts and globalization as well. And as a response to it, you see people wanting to focus more on this is mine and I'm Palestinian mm -hmm. and I'm this. So all that, I'm prefacing this to say, I understand that food is a global thing, that food is shared throughout history. And I've been researching food up to the fourth century. Mm -hmm. Everything is borrowed. The Ottomans borrowed from the Persians. The Ottomans borrowed from the Arabs that they uh, occupied as well. Food is very much, you know, a mishmash and it's a symbiotic process. That's diffusion. You learn from someone, you adopt it, you, you change it, etc. No one is denying that. Ingredients, tomatoes, they're from Mexico and South America. They're not from Italy. But mm. what's, you know, when you think Italian food, you think yeah. pasta, pizza, etc. When it comes to Israel, I think the distinction that I wanted to draw is it's understandable as a new country that is trying to galvanize nationalism that they would use food as a way to do it. But all this food that they're using, where has it come from? They acknowledge the food that came from Morocco and the food that came from Tunisia and the food that came from Eastern Europe. But the food which plays the biggest part in their repertoire, which is the Palestinian food that they were exposed to once they arrived in the early mm -hmm. 1900s, is the one that's completely removed from the conversation. Mm -hmm. And that intentional removing of that bit of information, if you will, is the part that's appropriation. You know, yeah. you're a country that prides yourself on being the byproduct of all these immigrant influences, why are you denying the major, major influence of Palestinian food? So that was a distinction I was trying, trying to yeah. draw in that article. No, I think it's, it's very important. And I think giving it that historical context and because the, their argument is, well, you know, this is part of our, our country's identity and history. And, and it's- But I mean, if a Japanese Jew, I don't know if they exist, but if someone from Japan were to come to Israel and start making sushi, does sushi become Israeli just because he's stuffing it with schnitzel instead of raw tuna? <laughs> I don't think anybody would eat schnitzel stuffed sushi. I hope not. <laughs> Again, you know, it's like all of the food, if you look at it, you break it down, you know, they'll say, hey, we're the ones that, you know, a schnitzel sandwich is Israeli. Okay, schnitzel is Austrian. Pita is the bread that you encountered when you came to this country. Just combining it together, make it Israeli. If you want to, go ahead. Yeah, but then don't deny that hummus you learn from the Palestinian population. And this is where I think it gets thorny because when you start arguing saying hummus is Palestinian, mm. people will push back and say it's not. And yeah, hummus is not Palestinian. Hummus is Levantine. I understand. But where did the Israelis learn hummus? They didn't learn it in Morocco. They didn't mm. learn it in Iraq. They learned it in Palestine when they came in yeah. the early 1900s. Yeah. And that's, that's where point. it's important to acknowledge where Absolutely. Do you think there needs to be more accountability of Israeli chefs who, who do appropriate Palestinian food? So, to be perfectly honest, I think you see some of it more and more now. Um, the accountability or the appropriation? Accountability. Okay. Um, to an extent. I think, I don't know if you know this, but one of my closest friends here happens to be an Israeli chef. Mm -hmm. And prior to, you know, I, we ended up becoming friends because we we're both in Philadelphia, we we're both in the food sphere. And I think before we became friends, the word Palestine was something that he was afraid of saying. You, you know what it's like for them. It's, yeah. 
threatening, it's whatnot. Since then, you know, his menus have changed. It's no longer Israeli salad. He calls it Arab salad, which is what they even call it in Israel. Um, there's the wines of Israel and Palestine. There's, you know, the word pal he shared my Washington Post article, alienating a lot of his base, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. The point I'm saying is when you get to know people from the other side, you get to know a Palestinian, you start to reckon for yourself mm -hmm. with the truth about appropriation. And that, I think, is a more powerful way to get that accountability to happen than to simply mm -hmm. protest and say, you're stealing my food, stop doing it. Because the natural reaction, just think of it in interpersonal relationships. Someone accuses you, your first line of defense is to de become defensive. It's not sure. to say, hey, you're right, I'm wrong. Yeah. But if they get to see it from the inside, they're like, oh my God, you're actually right. You know, mm -hmm. This is something I need to be more accountable for and it becomes like a domino effect you know one chef who's recognized as a star israeli chef does it other chefs start doing it as well and you see it more so i think this might be done let me just set okay. you on cool sorry that was so hot it's perfect it's fine the dish is ready and we can plate it right now um, I like to serve it with a wedge of lemon and some shakta, mm. just to bring out the flavors more. Obviously, the spice and lemon are, you know, optional. It's what people prefer. And you can see the consistency. It still has some liquid in it, but it's quite thick. So you're going to eat it like a thick soup. Now, if you're like me or like most Arabs and you like carbs on carbs, you can also eat it with bread. <laughs> if it's not if there's no bread on the table it's not a meal not a meal right no that's that's direct from my grandfather he will he refuses to eat anything without bread even if it's right even right you have to have bread and then at the end of the meal you have it with a piece of olive or cheese yeah. and so Oh, that there looks go. really good, Dream. That looks it's yummy. It's super simple. And then, you know, as much or as little pepper as you want on the side. And then you can just squeeze some lemon over it if you want extra. And that's it. Amazing. What's that red stuff, Dream? That's shatta. So it's a fermented red pepper paste. I like it spicy. So I always add just a small teaspoon on the side. You can mix it in. You can... And then some lemon. So this is just a squeeze of lemon. That's also optional, but I like it. Reem, that looks absolutely delicious. Thank you so much for taking the time. I learned so much more about the history of, of food and cuisine. Um, do Thank you, you wanna... for having me. This was yeah. a great way to start my weekend morning. Great. And can you tell people where they can find your stuff, where they can follow you, where they can get your book? So the easiest thing is to follow me on Instagram. And if they have any questions, I'm pretty responsive. Uh, my book, Anywhere Books Are Sold, Amazon, bookstores, I know in Jerusalem they sell it. But again, now with situations the way they are, it's probably a bit more difficult, but in better times, hopefully. Inshallah. Make sure to get it, people. Thanks so much, Reem. Stay Thank safe you, and healthy. Adam. You too. Take care.